What a marvelous, uh, tremendous room full of energy, competence, and uh, enthusiasm and optimism. And that's exactly, exactly what the soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardmen, and civilians who are out there benefiting from your leadership every day and who will benefit in the future, it's exactly what they deserve. So you are here today cross-leveling with some tremendous, tremendous speakers, present speaker excluded, that are going to help you put some tools in your toolbox. They're going to help you take it from good to great. And I think that's, uh, that's absolutely fantastic. So when they called and said they had a cancellation and they were desperate to fill this slot, uh, they asked me what I, you know, for about 20 minutes, what's something I could talk about that I was passionate about and that might, might put a tool in some of your toolboxes. Well, I think you're all aware, before any of our commanders take command, they go to a commander's course. And the commander's course is about two weeks long. And they sit down with other prospective commanders before they take over, and, they, and they're, up, they're briefed up on policy changes, leadership tips, but the, the real learning happens during the breaks when individuals sit down and say, hey, you were the XO of this, you were the XO of that, how did you handle these kind of challenges? Well, the one thing they make you do at this commander's course, at least the Marines do and I think they all do, is you're supposed to sit down and write your command philosophy. And your command philosophy is nothing more, if you distilled it down, does what does good look like? What does good look like in my organization? So any man or woman who comes in understands when they get up in the morning, if I do these things, I'm ringing the bell. I'm, I'm hitting it out of the park. That's what good looks like. And we've all probably gone into jobs, and I've done it, where a boss comes up to you and says, you got a great reputation. Your reputation got here before you. Uh, I don't need to tell you how to do your job. Go out there and get some. And, you, and first of all, you feel kind of good because you got this pat on the back. You go, yeah, I must be somebody. Until you get back to your office and you realize, I'm not quite sure what's expected me. I've never done this type of job before. I'm enthusiastic. I get up early. I've got a strong work ethic, but I'm not sure where the target is. So you work hard driving in that direction that you believe is correct. And the next thing, in my case anyway, you stand there going, but sir, uh, sir, ma'am, I thought that's what you wanted me to do. And you're saying to yourself, I didn't wake up this morning at 4.30 because I wanted to come in here and make an ass out of myself or embarrass the command or make you angry. But I obviously did. Because you left me in my own devices, didn't tell me what good looked like, I attacked where I thought good was. And what happens? Most of the time, you energize the men and women below you, and they're all rowing hard, you know, rowing hard in the same direction. We're plowing away. And little do we know that the objective is getting smaller, because it's 180 out from where I decide to take the team. So when I was at the commander's course at Quantico, I, I, am, a, I am a classic case of making it without talent. And, I, and I'm not being facetious when I say that. I was a, I was a sub-mediocre student at the Naval Academy, a, a marginal wrestler, and I've been a, been a fair, okay Marine throughout my career. So we're sitting at the commander's course. I'm a colonel. I'm in the library, because everybody else is writing 12 and 15 pages for their command philosophy. And they're quoting Sun Tzu and Clausewitz and you know General Powell. And, and I'm sitting over there tapping a pencil, and it's due tomorrow. So I go over to the card catalog, and I reach in, and I pull out one of those little Dewey Decimal cards. Probably no, only a handful of us here would know what Dewey Decimal was. <laughs> it's before you could Google stuff. You had to know how to do this to find something in the library. But they had some empty ones. So I take one out, and I sit down, and I go, my dad always said, keep it simple, say it often, and live it daily. And I thought to myself, if I write 13 pages of a command philosophy up, there's no way, no way I can be Sun Tzu, Clausewitz, and Colin Powell all in the same year, let alone in the same command for a, for a day. So I thought, OK, I'm going to keep it very simple. And I talked to my sergeant major from my previous command, and, uh, and we decided that if you kept it simple, maybe one word, what if your command philosophy was one word? It would be pretty easy to get up in the morning and jump up knowing that's the one word I'm going to live. And I came up with the word accountability. 
just to prove I'm not making this up, I brought about, I give them out to the midshipmen because I am really big on accountability. Absolutely believe whatever your leadership philosophy is, whatever your virtues, so humility, honor, integrity, courage, whatever they are, if they're not built on the bedrock of personal accountability and holding others accountable, it's a fairy tale. It's a bumper sticker on the back of the car in front of you. And if you don't believe it, eat it, and sleep it, uh, you're disingenuous almost. So I go, OK, accountability. I wrote one word down. Then I said, geez, I can't turn that in. That's pretty, that's pretty lean even on a card. So I broke it into four categories. First category is the card says, I'm accountable for my Marines and sailors, because we were naval in nature. You would say, I'm accountable for my warriors, my men and my women. And what does that mean? Does that mean all present are accounted for? I counted the noses, I have them. No, it absolutely goes unbelievably deeper than that. I had a first sergeant one time where we had a Marine that was having some problems. So what's he do? He finds out where the Marine lives. He drives out to the address where the Marine's address was. And it's a trailer park in North Carolina. And it is run down, and the trailer park manager is a tyrant. He tells them all, if you complain, I'll have your, uh, you don't know what I can do to you in your career. So he's got everybody intimidated. But the first sergeant does not intimidate in any way, shape, or form, comes on back, finally lets the officers know, and we get the SGA involved. And to make a long story short, we clean up the whole trailer park. So the Marine was having problems at work. Was he a malign actor? Did he come in to be a bad Marine? Or did he come in to be a bad soldier, sailor, coast Guard, guardsman, airman? No, there's usually some stimulus there. So when you say, I am accountable for my Marines and sailors, you go the extra mile. I mean, it's stronger self, stronger service. And the only kind of service that works is selfless service. Selfless service means all before self. Not I'm the emperor, you know, not I'm entitled, the only thing you're entitled to as you get promoted in the enlisted or officer ranks is you're entitled to serve more soldier, sailor, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, and their families. That's it. That's my entitlement. I can't wait to, to go to another job where I have more responsibility. But that accountability piece for your people is do they want to be educated? Do they, what do they want to do? Do they want to serve uh, for 30 years or continuously? Or do they have other goals in life? And you treat both those goals the same, because those are their goals and their aspirations. And they'll still break the tape at a dead run when they leave your service, but they'll leave feeling good about that experience. So I'm accountable for my Marines and sailors, point one. Point two, I'm accountable for my equipment. When you talk, most people think I'm accountable for my equipment. I have my rifle. I didn't lose it. You know, The bayonet is still on the end. I have my compass because it's tied onto my belt. I can't lose it unless I lose myself. But, but what I'm accountable for my equipment does mean that, but it goes deeper. If I'm entrusted with a piece of equipment, a radar, and, and the entire team is counting on me, and I just have my radar and haven't lost it, but I can only get 30% out of the use of that radar, but if I did my homework, became more professional, I could raise the capability and capacity of the whole team by virtue of my dedication to, to understand what my team has entrusted me with. And you can put any piece of equipment in there, a tank, a Humvee, a McCamming, mean, whatever your military operational specialty is, have you held your people accountable to get better and not flatline? So I'm accountable for my equipment. The next one is I'm accountable for my actions. Uh, the, the, the one thing that would get you fired in any unit I've ever had the opportunity to command was an excuse maker. If you walked in and something went wrong and you came in and said, hey, boss, I can't believe Lieutenant X let me down. You know, right off the bat, the person who walks in, starts grabbing people and throwing them under the bus is, is a phony leader, absolutely phony. Uh, when you walk in and something's gone wrong, you take the heat. When something's gone right, you pass the glory and the credit. Uh, so when I'm accountable for my actions, you just walk in. And I saw this one time where a four-star general was having somebody. I want to know who did it. And he said, you're talking to the person who authorized it. He said, that was not my question. I want to know who said that, who told him to do that. And this is in combat. And he said, sir, now, 
You've got the person who set the criteria and told the watch team what was to be done. And they executed perfectly on the guidance I gave them. And that's all you need to know. You're talking to the person who got it wrong. I mean, and that took moral courage, absolute moral courage. I mean, my knees were shaking, and I wasn't even in the, in the beaten path of the, uh, the machine gun fire. So you know, hold yourself accountable for your actions. But always remember, if things came out great, you, know, you never did it alone. Don't be an I-me person. You know, did you see what, what I just accomplished today? I was at a briefing once with General Abizade. Uh, we were up in uh, north of Baghdad. Commanding General's given a brief. And it's then I'm going to, well, I have a plan too. Well, then I'm going to move. After that, I will consolidate over. The whole staff in the room, I, I didn't see it because I was the OPSO. So I'm just taking notes. I want to see how he's tied in with the poles down south. He's got another division over here. So I'm kind of all tactically f uh, focused on it. But General Abizay was focusing on the leader. And we walked out, and he turned to me and said, what do you think about that brief? And I said, well, shit, sir, you know, he's pretty, he's coordinated with the Polish down here, and he's got this going on up by Baghdad. And General Abizade said, stop. I never heard so much I and me in my entire life. Did you see the, and I didn't, but he watched around the wall. Every time the word I came out, the shoulders drooped. You know, like, oh, you did it all yourself. What the hell are we? Why did I get up this morning? Why do I have these bags under my eyes? It probably wasn't intentional, but because of the frequency of the eye, then I'm going to. You know, if you want to plaster the glory, look no further than me. Those personal pronouns should only be used when you're taking heat. Hey, I screwed that up, boss. Ma'am, I've made that mistake. I got it. I'll correct it. It won't happen again. Or if you're looking to put the, the hook in somebody, look no further than me. So take accountability for your actions. And, uh, and, and always, when the heat's there, your, your natural tendency, the fight or flight, is find somebody to throw under the bus, because you feel the heat coming at you. But if you look at yourself, stronger self, stronger service, make sure when that comes, you can take that deep breath, take that adrenaline rush, and vector it into, into the next one we're going to talk about, which is I'm a combo for my lack of action. My lack of action. So if you stop and think about it, if everybody took action when they should take action, we wouldn't be in some of the dilemmas we are. Not only in the military, across the NCAA, across business. Somebody knows things aren't going right, but we give awards out for physical courage. You can, you know, you can go to West Point, Air Force, Navy, Coast Guard, uh, it, it doesn't matter, and you'll see for conspicuous gallantry, above and beyond the call of duty, when faced with unbelievable enemy fire, X, jump from the safest place they would ever be in. For the good of their men and women, move forward, braving the, you know, the, the physical courage piece is something we all respect, and it's something that's hard not to do, because everyone's watching you. How about the moral courage piece? When's the last time you walked in and saw for conspicuous gallantry above and beyond the call of duty, realizing criticism from peers, seniors, and subordinates alike, X stood tall in the face of that criticism and made the correct moral decision. And as was mentioned, I, I have the fortune of being the, the leadership chair within the Vice Admiral James Stockdale Ethical Leadership Center. All you have to do is read that man's bio. I, I am not worthy to, to wear one of his shoes, let alone sit in a center that has his name on it. But I take that very, very seriously. So every time I have the opportunity to give a class to the midshipmen, my last slide, I think I stole it out of the book, uh, uh, The Speed of Trust by Covey Jr. It's a slide, and has, I put Confucius on it, but they just had the quote by Confucius. And the quote says, to know what's right and not to do it is the worst of cowardice. The worst of cowardice. To know what's right and take a knee, tie your shoe, Turn right when the, when the challenge is left. Pick up the rock and go, oh my God, I hope no one saw me look under that rock because whew, what I saw under there is ugly. That's when true leaders, that's when stronger self, stronger service comes to the individual who walks out and says, let's look under these rocks. 
or the sergeant major, the command master chief is telling the boss, or the boss is telling the sergeant major, or the, uh, you know, whichever way that goes. True leaders look for the opportunity to, number one, inspire. I'm not telling you to go out there and, you know, walk around like Nurse Cratchit and, uh, or, or, or Attila the Hun looking for things you can pound people on, because it's also your job to inspire and, and, and get people jacked up. But it is definitely your job to uphold the uncompromising standard. I bet you not a day goes by, and I'll ask you to just check yourself. When you wake up at 2 in the morning and your stomach burns, you're going, damn, ah. Oh. And it's always woulda, shoulda, coulda. I woulda. I should have got involved. I could have done something. But there's no groundhog days in the real world. You know, the alarm doesn't go off the next morning, and you relive that day. That opportunity has passed. And worst of all, someone saw you look under that rock or see something wrong, and you were in a position of leadership. Doesn't matter if you're an officer, an NCO, a staff NCO, I don't care. If you see something wrong, other people see you see that, and you turn away from it, that's the new standard. That is now the acceptable standard because you didn't have the intestinal fortitude, the moral courage to become engaged. And becoming engaged doesn't mean screaming and yelling. It's a teaching moment. You know, it's coach, teach, mentor, illuminate. Make them understand what they were doing was wrong and build apostles. Build apostles, those who will speak in tongues and continue to, to take action when they know they should, but every ounce in their body, fear of criticism, peer pressure, tells them, you know, it, you know, I don't want to. But the bottom line is, if not me, then who? If not me, if I don't do it, then how do I have a right to complain that others should have become involved? I can't believe that's going on in that unit. Everybody has to know about it. Why the hell isn't somebody taking action? Well, as you said, stronger self before stronger service. And if, you, if you're making yourself strong, hopefully that'll, that'll flow down. Then I'll close by saying, there was a backside to the card, and I thought, well, I can't turn in a half a card. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's a waste of half a card. So I, I, came up, I came up with three things that I asked every Marine and sailor. I did this, first of all, I had the opportunity to command the 2nd Marine Regiment. That's about 3,200. 3, the second one was the 2nd uh, Marine Division. That's about 17,000. And the last one was the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force in combat. And that had soldiers, airmen, sailors, everybody in it in Al Anbar province. And that was 50,000. Never changed. It isn't like I'm going to the next level. I've got to change my philosophy. The only thing that changed was the logo on the card. Same, same thing, accountability code, backside. Ask yourself three questions. Who did I teach today? What did I teach them? What did I learn today, and who did I learn it from? A teaching, learning day, every day. And the last one, and I, and I really stress this when the last one is, who did I make smile? Who did I make smile? This is tough business. I mean, you, you need to take your job seriously, but not yourself seriously. No one ever got up and said, these last four years really sucked. They were gruesome. I was pounded every day. I can't wait to re-enlist for four more. Uh, <laughs> doesn't happen. And, and a lot of that is involved in the command climate and the way you build a learning, a, a learning and cl a climate where I can get my juice in there, I can get some skin in the game, my ideas are on the table, I'm allowed to debate it, I can ask you why, we can have discourse. Not a unit where any time I say why, any time I challenge you, it's considered to be disrespect. And I'll close by saying, please, set a command climate where disagreement is encouraged. Respectful disagreement is encouraged. It is not disrespect. Because the first time, and I've seen it, where the boss said, well, how about, how about some ideas here? You know, we have a big problem coming up. Who's got some ideas? How about the back row? And this, this it was a joint command. This officer raises the hand, goes up. Well, I'm thinking about this, boss, and here is the answer. You've got to be kidding me. That's so sophomoreish. That's amateur. That's amateur. You don't think I've thought of that already? When I ask for ideas, I mean new, fresh ideas. And he looks around the table, you hear, nah, 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 nah. the ambulance comes in, loads this individual up, takes him out. <laughs> All right, anybody else have any ideas? You know, everybody, oh man, that didn't look like fun. So the bottom line is that you have to create that inclusive environment. So teach, learn, but most importantly, make somebody smile. I'll leave these cards up here. Uh, I, hey, how about that? I'm only about two minutes over. So uh, I want to thank you very much for your continued service. Uh, I had, a, I had a great ride, 37 years. I enjoyed every minute of it, but the only reason I enjoyed every minute and the only reason I had anything that might even be 
quantified as success is because I was inclusive, bright young men and women got their ideas on the table, and we were able to pick the best ones in peacetime and in combat. God bless you all, and hoorah.